Hello again, it's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com where I talk about acoustic treatment techniques for home and project studios that actually work without all the voodoo. Now lately I've discussed bass traps a lot here on the channel and I've showed you how you can find the right type for your room and why it's sometimes so difficult to understand what they actually do and how you're supposed to use them and where to put them and all that. But one of the things that you've probably heard me say or at least somebody say on the internet is you can't really get enough bass traps for your room. And you might be wondering, well, hang on, I've definitely heard rooms that had too much treatment, they were over damped and they kind of ended, ended up sounding kind of dead. Isn't the same thing possible in the low end? Like if you get too many bass traps, can you actually take away too much bass from your room? Now that might make sense at first, but it's actually missing two crucial ingredients. And it's not really possible in theory or in practice to absorb too much bass. So that's what I want to show you today. I want to explain what people mean when they say you can't have enough bass traps and why it's actually impossible to take away too much bass from your room. So to understand this properly, I think it's worth taking a step back and just quickly think about what we're trying to achieve with the sound in our studios in the first place. And I guess very simply put, you could say, we want to hear our speakers as unaltered as possible, right? We want that honest representation of the music. We want to hear what is actually happening with the material. And especially when we apply EQ or compression or we add uh, artificial space like reverb or delay, we want to hear what that's actually doing and make sure that when we take that music outside of our studio, the same thing happens, right? It translates properly to speakers outside of our studio. So we, we want to hear our speakers as unaltered as possible. Now let's do a quick thought experiment. Imagine you're floating in midair with just your speakers, okay? So no room around you, no ceiling, no floor, no surfaces at all, just air, right? And if you play music, now all you're hearing is the sound directly from your speakers. And obviously at that point, it's completely unaltered. It's exactly what we want. Now imagine the same scenario, but we put up the flat surfaces of a room around us. And now the sound reflects off of those surfaces and resonances build up between them. And all that energy adds on top of what we're hearing directly from the speakers. All that energy fuses at your eardrums, which changes or distorts that pristine sound, that unaltered sound we originally had from our speakers. This is where it gets a bit counterintuitive because although we're adding stuff on top, the way that interference works means that all that energy, when it mixes with the direct sound, it causes both dips and bumps all across the spectrum. So if we originally had that flat, unaltered sound from our speakers, now it's all bumpy and smeared in time. Acoustic treatment is all about removing this effect, that change or that distortion that the room adds to the direct sound so that we can get back to that original unaltered version where we can actually tell what's going on in the music. So this is where a really interesting problem creeps in because if you remove the room completely, you actually make it really unpleasant to be in for us, the, the user of that room. Um, you basically start down a path towards an anechoic chamber. And what happens at that point is that the visual cues that your brain gets, so what we see, doesn't match our auditory cues or what we hear. So we, we, our brain has a problem decoding that space because it sees something different than it hears. And that makes it really unpleasant to be in. This is the major conundrum of studio acoustics because on one hand, we want to remove the room's effect on the speakers as much as possible while still keeping the auditory cues that the room gives us so that our brain basically knows where it is. And this isn't easy to do. All those control room strategies from the past, like live end, dead end, or reflection-free zone, or 
non-environment or all the others, they've all tried to solve that problem in their own way, some more scientifically and successfully than others. The most recent and advanced approach is, in my opinion, the Northward Acoustics front to back design. It's quite ingenious, you should definitely check that out. There was an interview with uh, Thomas Jean Jean who runs Northwood Acoustics uh, in tape op not too long ago. I'll link uh, to that article in the description. The important point is, is that you cannot absorb so much bass that you basically end up reducing audible low end, like cutting it with an EQ. That's just not how it works. Basically, you're just removing the impact that the room has on the direct sound from your speakers. So the problem isn't taking away too much of the room sound and ending up not hearing your speakers properly or your work not translating properly. The problem is taking away too much of the room sound and ending up with the space that doesn't feel comfortable to be in. They're two separate things. The thing is, when treating a small room, actually any kind of room, this is only possible in the mids and highs. And the reason is that those auditory cues that I was telling you about before, right, that tell you about the shape and size of a room, they're mainly dependent on the reverb and the reflections in the mid and high frequencies. Removing too much of the room in the mids and highs, aka over damping, is what makes a room sound dead, especially if the lows are completely left uncontrolled. That's where standing waves dominate what the room adds to this mess, and they don't contribute nearly as much to our perception of the actual room size. But standing waves are the main thing that stop us from hearing the low end unaltered because they mess with the direct sound from the speakers. So it doesn't create any further problems if we reduce their impact by properly absorbing them. In fact, the more we get rid of them, the more balanced and cleaner and punchier our low end gets but it wouldn't affect how we perceive the room itself while we're in it. But in practice, especially in small rooms, it's actually really hard to get there. It really takes a lot of bass absorption, of low frequency absorption to significantly reduce the impact of standing waves. They just carry so much energy and their wavelengths are just so long. Usually we just don't have enough physical space in our rooms for bass traps to get rid of them completely. So that's what people mean when they say you can't have enough bass traps, right? On one hand, it's basically impossible to somehow break or reduce the amount of usable low-end energy in your room. And then on the other hand, even if you use all the available space you've got for bass trapping, you'll probably just have removed enough of the room's impact to get that low-end control and get your low-end mix decisions to translate properly. Now sometimes you might still feel like you're losing low-end when you start adding bass traps to your room and controlling the low-end. So what's going on there? Remember how I told you how the room creates dips and bumps by interfering with the direct sound from your speakers, right? So imagine you've been working in that kind of situation for a while and you've actually been exposed to a pretty hefty bump for, for some time now, then your brain will have conditioned itself to that. You'll have gotten used to it. And now if you remove that bump through bass trapping, you'll actually feel like you're losing low end energy. But in fact, what's happening is you're getting closer to an objectively or technically correct low end balance. Now that might take some getting used to, but what you should find is that over time, it'll become much easier to work with and more importantly, that your decisions translate much better to the outside world, right? You'll start getting much more confident in your work and the decisions that you make. So what I want you to take away here is that you really shouldn't worry about absorbing too much space. It's not really possible in theory or in practice. So it's not something you need to think about when you're turning your small spare bedroom or a basement or attic or a, or whatever into a, a home or project studio to work from. But if you are just getting started with bass trapping or you're thinking about an upgrade, I highly recommend you actually check out my free complete guide to bass traps first, which I've linked in the description below. It's kind of like an encyclopedia of different bass traps designs that I've compiled for you. And it goes through how they work, the different pros and cons of the different designs, 
how many you would need, where you need to place them in your room, and basically if they're the right approach for you, if they're the right solution and you if you should invest your money in them so if you're currently on the hunt for a base trap if you're looking to understand what's going on with all these different designs have a look at the complete guide to base traps it's completely free just click on the link in the description but for now i hope that helps you understand more about the broader picture of how base traps work and that you don't need to worry about absorbing too much low end i'll see you soon